Hello, welcome to Online uh, Freedom Church, Online FC. Uh, my name is Scott, I'm the lead pastor at Colorado Freedom Church. I'd like to welcome you to a special edition of Online FC today. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently uh, going forward here in 2024. Our online uh, Freedom Church is going to look a little different uh, than our in-person uh, worship gathering. Uh, it's not going to be done live, so we're not going to broadcast uh, what happens in-house. There are several reasons for this, uh, but I think the, the most important one is we want to see you in person. Uh, if you're in town, if you're in Colorado Springs and you consider Freedom Church your home, uh, we'd love to see you in person. Uh, we meet at 6862 Galley Road at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, on Sundays and then also Sunday nights at 5. Uh, but uh, we also understand that there's a lot of folks who can't be with us, uh, uh, whether you live in a different state or you're homesick or whatnot. So we do still want to uh, provide you with some of the, uh, the content uh, that you would get if you were in person. Uh, if you do regularly attend uh, Freedom Church, we are going to be recording uh, our in-house gatherings, uh, and then the link will be sent out uh, the following week uh, so you don't miss uh, anything uh, if you do regularly attend. If you are uh, out of state or you're out of Colorado Springs, uh, my encouragement to you would be to find a church home, a local gathering uh, where you can uh, be seen in person, where, as we often say at Freedom Church, you can uh, you can be smelled, people can smell you, uh, can hug you. Uh, it's incredibly important to uh, not forsake the gathering of believers. Uh, and so we at Freedom Church want to help you do that. Uh, so no matter where you're at, uh, if you would like uh, help finding a, a faith family that's uh, um, a good fit for you, uh, just reach out to us. I'd love to, to schedule a time to, to talk with you uh, and help you find one. <clears throat> so we are um, starting a new series at Freedom Church. And so we're just going to kind of jump uh, right into that uh, here today. So one of the most common, if not the most common, New Year's resolution is to lose weight and get healthy. Uh, Americans spend a tremendous amount of money on care for their physical bodies. I often wonder if we took that same time, energy, and money and looked after our spiritual bodies, um, what would happen, right? And I mean this not just on a personal level, uh, and uh, but I mean that... Uh, mean this on the corporate level uh, as far as us as the body of Christ. And so over the next several months, we're going to look at the church, what it is, what are the activities of the local church, kind of the difference between uh, the church universal, uh, which is followers of Christ uh, from uh, the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2 uh, until present day, uh, versus the local church, what happens in a local uh, faith family whether that's the local church of your city or the local church uh, where you particularly gather. So these, these next several months are going to serve as a foundation uh, for us understanding how to be together, how to treat one another. And as we work through different biblical texts, uh, my hope and prayer is that we as Freedom Church uh, realize what our specific calling and, and mission is. So the question then is what is the church, right? Dictionary.com says it's a building uh, for public Christian worship. In 1828, uh, yes, that's the year 1828, uh, Webster's Dictionary has two definitions. One, a house consecrated to the worship of God, and two, the collective body of Christians or of uh, those who profess to believe in Christ and acknowledge him to be Savior of mankind. So obviously, uh, I have a huge disagreement with the dictionary.com definition and even the first part of Webster's. Um, and that's, I think, the problem in the world today, right? How often do we hear the question, where do you go to church? As opposed to, hey, you are the church, right? Uh, who do you invite to come to church? As opposed to, hey, where, where is your church gathering? Uh, the emphasis has been on a building uh, for far too long. So today, we kind of live in this dispensation of grace. It's a present age of grace where God's doing something special and wonderful, and we need to kind of stop and understand what God is doing in the world today and how he's doing it. So let's look at Matthew 16, verse 18, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. This is Jesus speaking. This is before the birth of the church. This is while he's walking around with his disciples and he's giving his disciples instructions. And so from this important verse, we learn uh, four things. First of all, we learn that Jesus Christ is the builder, right? Uh, and we also learn that the building is upon a rock. And the church is, a, is the building, but it's not 
a building. It's not a physical building. So the church where you're gathering, uh, the, the church building, excuse me, see, I, I even do it now. The church building where you gather, that's not a church. That's a facility. It's a gathering place. That's where the church meets. We also see, number four, that the church belongs to Jesus Christ. It is his church. He says, I will build my church. So today, the Lord Jesus Christ is building something. He's building something very precious to him. Uh, he's building something that belongs to him in a very personal way, right? He says, I will build my church. And this building is, is a unique building. It's not like the buildings we see when we visit a city. Uh, this building is, is not made of lifeless bricks or cement or steel or wood. Rather, this building is built uh, is made of living stones first peter 2 5 you also the living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ these stones are people who have believed in the crucified and risen christ as their personal savior as their lord uh, in john 1 12 it says yet to all who did receive him to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God. So if you've believed in Jesus Christ for salvation, if you've trusted him, you're a child of God, you've been made a living stone. So let's look at the body of Christ. All right, as we have seen, the church is described as a building, a building that's made of living stones or living believers. And not only is the church described as a building, but it's also described as a body. Ephesians 1 uh, verses 22 and 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. He's talking about Jesus here, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. All right, and then Colossians 1, verse 18, and he, this is again being Jesus, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. All right, these verses teach us that the church is the body of Christ. And what's interesting here, and what I love about this, is that every believer is a member of this body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. Now this is Paul speaking to a local body of believers, a collection, a, a church family, a faith family. So the head of this body is Christ. And the church is a living organism. It's a body made up of living members. So how do you become a member of the true church? How does a person become a stone in this building? How does a person become a member of the body of Christ? Well, that's what we call the gospel. That's what we call uh, the good news. And so here we have the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church and he's in heaven. And then followers of Jesus make up his body and we're here on earth. But there's these people that are not in the body of Christ. So how do they become the body of Christ? Each member of the church is related to, to Christ and to each other, to the other members of the church. And no one can become a member of Christ's church unless they go uh, through the cross by faith. When a person does this, God places them into his body, right? So, so if you're an unbeliever, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, if you haven't trusted him for salvation, you need to know that there's no way that you can be saved, that you can have a life of fellowship with God and a life of healthy, vibrant fellowship with other people without Jesus Christ. You must trust him. You must understand that you are incapable of, of saving yourself, that you are a sinner, that you, that you uh, don't know what you're doing in life and that you need help. And that help can only be found in Jesus Christ. And so when you trust him, when you believe in him for that, you become a body of Christ. You have a new family. You are a new person. It's a beautiful thing. So are you a member of the body of Christ? Have you come to the cross uh, through faith by believing that he died for you, that he paid the full penalty for your sins? Have you believed that on the, the crucified and risen Christ? And today, uh, all the people who are really saved are part of the body of Christ. And that's called the church. So that's that's just kind of an overview of the body. Now I want to see, take a step back and take a look at how the church started. All right. So hang with me for a bit. So the church has not always existed. When Adam was created, there was no church. In the days of Noah, there was no church. Abraham, David, Isaiah, all these people from the Old Testament, they may have been believers, but they were not members of the church because the church did not exist yet. There's no church in the days of John the Baptist. In the days when Jesus walked to the earth, there was no church. The church did not begin in, until after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how special the church is. On the night before his death on the cross, Jesus told his disciples about a special day when the Holy Spirit would come to live in every believer. 
right? John chapters 14 through 16 are the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples the night before he died. And in there, he talks about uh, something called the advocate or someone called the advocate. And that's another name for the Holy Spirit. The word advocate, right, means helper, the one who is called to your side to help and comfort and encourage you. Listen to what he says, in, uh, to what Jesus says in John 16, verses 7 to 13. This is about the time when the Holy Spirit would come. It says this, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove to the, to the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can no longer uh, see me. About judgment, when, uh, because the, the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will speak you, uh, or he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. That's the Holy Spirit. So Jesus promised his disciples that someone would be sent to advocate and comfort them, to abide with them, to live with them, to teach them, to testify or, or bear witness of Christ to them and to guide them. And this person that Jesus spoke of is the Holy Spirit. So the coming of the Holy Spirit was one of the most important events in history. It was on this day that the church began. We see in Acts 11.15 that the day of Pentecost is referred to as the beginning. The beginning. It was on this day that the church was born. It was on this day that God came to live with his believers in a very special way. The Holy Spirit will be with you and he will abide with you forever. He will live with you forever. The Holy Spirit came on a special day called the day of Pentecost. Uh, we re read about the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Uh, and so let's see. Uh, just a kind of a chart that helps us understand kind of the timing of all things, right? So we see the birth of Jesus. That's what we just celebrated at Christmas. And Jesus died 33 or 34 years later. He spent three days in an empty tomb, and then he was resurrected from the dead. And for 40 days, he, he walked on the earth, still talking and teaching and, and seeing his disciples and, and really giving them the mission that he wanted them to do going forward. And then 40 days after his resurrection, he, he was taken up to heaven. He ascended into heaven. It's what we call the ascension. And before he ascended, he told his disciples, go wait in Jerusalem. Something, this someone, this advocate, this person's going to come to you, right? <clears throat> and then 10 days after he ascended, uh, we have the day of Pentecost. We see the coming of the Holy Spirit. So on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. The church was born. Uh, this is when God came to live in believers in a very special way. So we sometimes uh, refer to Christmas as the birthday of Jesus. Uh, Christmas reminds us of the time when, when God left heaven and came to live in, in a human body. This is what John describes as the Word became flesh. Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. It's also in theological terms, it's called the incarnation where we see God in human flesh where God came to live in a human body. And the day of Pentecost, this should remind us of the time when God, the Holy Spirit, came to live in the body, the body of Christ. That's the church. It was on this day the Holy Spirit came to live in believers and the church was born. What we see here is that the church, right, the church is the dwelling of God through the Spirit. In Ephesians 2, 22, and in him, in Christ, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. So we celebrate Pentecost 50 days after when we celebrate Resurrection Day, right? So this year in 2024, Pentecost is on May 19th. So if you're at home, start planning now for a big birthday celebration on May 19th. I'm lucky Pentecost usually falls around my wife's birthday. Uh, so we'll be celebrating her on May 18th. And then, then May 19th, we'll be celebrating the birth of the church, all right? So how do people get added to the body and to the building? Let's look at what happened in Acts. In Acts 115, there's about 120 believers, right? This was after Jesus had, had lived, had, had died, had buried, uh, with, had resurrected, he had ascended, he had commissioned uh, the believers. There was about 120 believers. In Acts chapter 2, we learn that the Holy Spirit came upon these people. The church was born, the day of Pentecost. And when the church began, it was a body of 120 people. It was a building with 120 living bricks. And later that same day, Peter, the Apostle Peter, he preached a message and many people believed. 
in Acts 2.41, it says that God was, uh, that, that 3,000 people were added to the church, that 3,000 people were added to their numbers. And it's cool because God's not finished building his, his building. He's not finished with it. He's not building, he's not finished with the church yet. In fact, he's just begun. In Acts 2.47, we see the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the number continues to go up. Every day, new bricks were being added to the building. New members were being added to the body. In Acts 4.4, 4, we see, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to be about 5,000. So there was also women and children involved. So the number was much greater than 5,000. So God continued to add bricks and bodies to his building. In Acts 5, uh, 5, uh, 14, it says many more were added. In 11.24, a great number were added. And the good news for you and me is that God is still building his church. Someday the building project will be finished, but it's not finished yet. God is still saving people, adding them to the body of Christ. That which God is doing in the world today is described in Acts 15, 14, which says God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. So God is still in the business of saving people. He still wants to see those who are outside the body of Christ be brought into the body of Christ. And, and he wants the church, his faith family, to, to be the body of Christ. And so that's what we're going to look at over the next several months is how, how do we be the body? How do we present Christ? How do we be the hands and feet of Jesus? All these, how do we be salt? How do we be light? How do we, how do we take uh, the, the, the good news to the ends of the earth? And that's the job of the church. So those are just some things uh, that we're going to talk about this morning in the in-person gathering. Once again, I'd encourage you to, to be here if, in, if you're in the Springs. If you're not, please find a faith family that you can plug into, that you can be a body with. Uh, but we're going to close our time uh, by, uh, by looking at a couple of questions, right? Is this really important to you, right? I'm sure you've heard a lot of sermons about the church being a body. But my challenge to you would be look at your actions. Do your actions reflect that belief. Like if you truly believe this, if you believe that, yeah, I'm, I'm part of the body of Christ, then you need to be with the body of Christ. You need to be around them. You need to be talking with them. You need to know them. You need to be known by them. Warts and all, right? We all have, have hurts, habits, and hangups, but the important thing is that we, we, we do life in community. You can't mature on your own. You can't can't grow past a certain level on your own. You need other believers in your life. So gather with other believers, right? I want to close by looking at Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. And if you were with Freedom Church on, on the 31st of December in 2023, uh, Andrew preached a message on this. And, and this was his challenge to us in the new year. This was his challenge to make this our new year's resolution, right? Philippians 2 says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, when you and I read that through Western eyes, through individualistic eyes, right? We read that and say, oh, that's speaking to us. But Philippians was a letter written to the church at Philippi. This letter would have been read aloud to everybody. So when we hear uh, it say, tenderness and compassion, be like-minded, uh, same love, one in spirit, one mind, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, love others and value others above yourself, look to the interests of others. He's talking to a church gathering. He's talking to a community of people. It's not you as an individual solely. It's the church. And so let me pray for us, uh, and then uh, we'll be done. So Father God, thank you uh, for an opportunity to share uh, what's on my heart this morning with our online uh, faith family. I pray and hope that as we consider the words of Scripture, that we look at the Bible, uh, that we look at what it says about gathering together, that as we, we understand what it means to be uh, the body of Christ, to be the building, with li the, that we are the living stones in the building of, of Christ's church, that it's his church. I pray that as we understand that, that you would 
give us a, a holy conviction and the courage that we need to maybe step out and join a local faith family, to maybe uh, uh, be more involved in our local uh, church, to be um, more transparent, more vulnerable with those in our lives that we would say, this is my brother and sister in Christ. We pray all of this, and this is all possible because of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a blessed week. Uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, and uh, we'll see you around. God bless.